Let's check out this fish. This here is a common red snapper. Nothing particularly special. Wait, what is that? That's no tongue. Snapper, your tongue has eyes. Ermagerd. Introducing Simothoa exigua. A louse. These louses, they're, they're parasites. And oh man, they're a doozy of one. Um, just a side note, parasites are awesome. They're one of my favorite classes of organisms. Um, their life cycles, their behaviors, how they get to the host, and then what they do to the host, parasites are awesome. <laughs> Um, but anyway, let's go back to our, our friendly little louse inside of our fish mouth. Check it out. It goes, uh, it'll attach itself to the red snapper, crawl along the snapper until it gets into the snapper's mouth, and then it bites into the snapper's tongue, and then feeds on the blood of the tongue, and as the tongue kind of obviously gets hurt by that, the, the tongue shrinks, and the... Um, the louse will eventually attach itself <laughs> to the stub of a tongue that's left over and then continue feeding on any of the food and mucus and other things that are in the snapper's mouth. The snapper starts using the louse as a tongue. Um, just wacky. Um, the louse will stay there <laughs> until either the louse dies or the fish dies. Oh, can you imagine? How does this make sense at all? Um, let's, let's think natural selection. Remember, natural selection is all about gaining some sort of advantage. What advantage is to be gained for the red snapper? Um, to have its tongue chewed out. Um, and really, just like our any other previous example with, like, say, the rabbits, you can't just keep having a faster and faster and faster rabbit. That just doesn't cut it. Eventually, there needs to be some sort of balancing factor. In terms of rabbits, it's eventually food and energy. In terms of the louse and the fish, it's the number of hosts available. Like, uh, like the the louse kind of also needs to act as a tongue for the snappers because if they were too efficient at killing the fish they would die too they need hosts they need something to attach to so it's all a balancing act and yes the snapper is negatively affected um, but as long as there is a net positive effect on the system the ecosystem then it's still naturally favored. It still can be selected for. It's just a crazy situation, but that's, that's parasites. So these two species have found themselves dependent on each other. Uh, this is a parasitic dependence. Uh, we call that interdependence. Inter meaning between and dependence meaning dependent on. So they're dependent between each other. This parasitism is a special kind of interdependence called symbiosis. Let's look at a, another cool uh, example of this special kind of interdependence, this symbiosis. Uh, there's a, a really cool moth that Charles Darwin stumbled upon during his travels. Uh, this moth had an extraordinarily long tongue, um, measuring upwards of like a regular ruler length. And based on his theory of natural selection, he looked at it and he was like, this moth has to feed on something suitable for this tongue. Um, and he never actually got to witness the, the moth feeding on a flower. Uh, and it was actually quite some time, over a century later, that a researcher uh, interested in Charles Darwin, uh, stumbled upon this moth with this huge tongue uh, feeding on uh, a flower that had a very long body. Uh, so the nectar was in the bottom of the, of the flower and only this moth had a long enough tongue to reach it. So his, his prediction was true. Uh, Darwin, using his theory of natural selection, um, simply predicted that for this moth to have a really long tongue, there must be a flower with a really long body 
that it feeds from. This relationship between the moth and the flower is pretty exclusive. The, the moth can only feed from that flower. It's got this gigantic tongue. It probably wouldn't do very well trying to feed from a regular sized flower. Uh, likewise, there's no other insect can reach the nectar from this flower, so they're not even going to try. So this exclusive relationship, this connection between the two of them, this symbiosis, uh, there's got to be a reason. Like, there's got to be a solid, positive reason why that would be naturally selected for, why those two species would evolve together so that the moths have long tongues and the flowers have long bodies. So, why the exclusivity? Why are they so deeply connected like that? Well, let's think about reproduction. And it's always worth mentioning, when we bring up reproduction, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to, pr to reproduce. So, imagine most plants. Their strategy for reproducing is to produce a whole bunch of pollen grains and then that pollen is exposed to the wind and the wind will take that and sail the pollen all the way all over the area that the plant lives in in hopes that one or more of those pollen grains will land on the female reproductive parts of the flower of another plant. So that like that's a huge gamble imagine the millions billions of pollen grains required to have a decent enough shot for that to work out for that kind of strategy to to even make sense so um let's think about our moth and flower situation the moth when it goes and lands on the flower the flower gets something out of it the flower deposits its pollen grains. The moth has to go through the pollen grains in order to get the nectar. So they stick all to the fur of the moth. And then the moth, since it can only feed on those flowers, it's going to pick up, fly, and go directly to another one of those flowers. That makes reproducing for that flower so simple. They don't have to produce millions or billions of pollen grains hoping that one of them will land. They just need to have the right postman. So that's what the moth does. The, the moth gets food and the flower gets very easy reproduction. That sounds like a pretty good win-win. That's interdependence. We've been talking about symbiosis enough that we can talk about the classifications of symbiosis. There's three main ones that we're going to talk about in this course. Uh, the first one is mutualism. Mutualism is where you've got two different species and they're interdependent on each other, but they both benefit. They both get something good out of it. Now, uh, an example of that, like the moth and the flower that we were just talking about, there's a cool kind of fish that'll actually clean hippo teeth. So the, the hippos get uh, some dental work and the fish get a meal out of it. The second one is commensalism. That's where one of the species benefits and the other isn't affected, not harmed by it. A couple of examples of that, like uh, birds living are living in trees, like building their nests in the top of a tree. The nest doesn't hurt the tree, doesn't help the tree at all, but the tree provides a pretty sweet safe haven for the birds. Now there's still some predators that get up in the trees, but they avoid a lot of predators by not being on the ground. The third type of symbiosis that we're going to talk about is parasitism. Uh, we talked about parasitism at the beginning when we were talking about that wacky louse that crawls into the mouth of the snapper. But there's lots of parasites. A uh, couple of examples with humans, uh, like tapeworms, that go inside of your intestines and they eat your food and chemically screw things up in your body as well. Uh, then there's also some ringworms, ringworms and nematodes. Uh, there's some ringworms that uh, will infect your eye. Um, there's ringworms that get under your skin 
and uh, in general pretty terrible. They're not good for us. Uh, a parasitism is where one benefits and the other is harmed in the process. So when a coyote catches a rabbit, do we consider that parasitism? After all, the, the coyote is benefiting and the rabbit is getting harmed. Um, no, not quite. Remember, the term symbiosis means living together. <laughs> There's not too much living together when that rabbit gets caught by the coyote. They're dead. Um, predator prey is another type of interdependence. It's not symbiosis, but it's still interdependence nonetheless. The, the predators clearly rely on the prey. They need that food source. But on top of that, the prey also rely on those predators. It's an interesting little phenomenon. If the predators weren't there, think about what would happen to the prey population, like with deer. Um, their population would skyrocket. So, there would be a huge number of deer in a small, tiny area, and uh, that leads to nothing good. Their food that they consume, that's going to start to plummet. Um, as the available food and water um, goes down, so does their health. That opens up disease and starvation and all these other things that can completely obliterate their population. Prey populations depend on predators to help them keep in check. Now obviously the rabbit that gets caught by the predator, they're not dependent on that predator too much. They would love to get away. But the population of rabbits depends on their predators. When you start talking about predator prey, you're inevitably going to start talking about natural selection again. There's more than one coyote vying to get that rabbit. Let's say there's two different coyotes hunting the same rabbit. The one that gets the rabbit gets to eat. The other one doesn't. So natural selection in essence is really all about competition. So remember we said with natural selection whichever organisms, whichever species has an advantage they're going to uh, be the ones that are likely to pass on their genes to their population. So uh, the best competitors are the ones that get to pass on their genes. Natural selection is all about competition. Who fights who? Who gets to win? Who gets the food? Who gets to the water? Uh, who gets to live in the nice cushy little den that uh, they found? Uh, animals fight each other over these resources. That's called competition. So let's come up with a definition for competition. Uh, let's use a simple food web to help illustrate this picture. Wait, I said simple. Simple turn it. That's better. So from this picture, we can see that there's, there's several different animals that are vying for the exact same resources. Both the hawk and the fox want the rabbits. Um, the, the hawk and the fox want the squirrels. Uh, the hawk, fox, and weasel wants the mouse. When there's multiple organisms, whether it's within a species or between species, when there's several organisms that are trying to get a resource, like the mouse for example, that's competition. So how do we know when they're in, in actual competition? So we need to introduce another term to help us finish defining competition, and that is the term niche. An organism's niche is their role in the environment. Each organism has lots of different roles in their environment, um, but let's try and define, for example, the hawk's niche. When they're awake, what they eat, what eats them, which organisms they affect, how they affect the landscape around them, that's their niche. That would be the hawk's niche. So let's imagine the hawk was exclusively awake during the day and the fox was exclusively awake during the night. 
they wouldn't be technically in competition because their niches don't overlap. Their, the time that they're awake is separate, the time that they're hunting. So the, the prey that they capture will be different. Um, however, if there was some overlap, let's say like in the, the morning hours, when the fox are just finishing up their hunting and the hawks are just about to start, if there was some overlap in the time that they're hunting, that moment in between where they are both hunting for the same thing is where they would be competing. And the same is true on locations as well. If uh, there, there were several organisms that fed on a tree, if they wanted to feed on the same place of the tree, they would be in competition. They would be fighting each other, and they do fight each other over that resource. So this is where natural selection comes in. It's all about competition. Whoever is the best competitor gets to survive because they're getting the resources they need to. And if they're getting enough resources, they are the best competitor. They are going to be the ones most likely to make babies as well. So how do we end up with organisms that do compete? How do they not end up completely annihilating each other? And it's all about coexistence. The more their niches overlap, the more resources that and space that they're competing over, the more likely it is that one of them will get pushed out, one of them will go extinct. If they split themselves in some way that allows them to coexist, then they can both live. Uh, like I said with the example with hawk and foxes, if they're hunting at different times, they can coexist. There's a really cool example of coexistence with uh, these warblers. They both, or they all, like to feed on uh, these, these pine trees. They make their homes there, and several different species of warbler will live in the exact same tree. Have a look at this diagram. They're the way that they make it work is that the different species of warbler will make their homes and feed on specific parts of the tree. Some warblers right at the top, some near the bottom, some just on the edges, and as long as they can keep that separation between them, they can coexist. That type of coexistence where they divide the resources amongst species is called resource partitioning. As long as there's some separation in the, the resource requirement, they can coexist. If there's any overlap at all, they will compete. And animals will fight to the death over resources. The natural world is a scary place. Let's wrap this up. We've talked about several different types of independence so far. First, we talked about three forms of symbiosis. Remember, symbiosis means living together. So three cases where organisms live together, one being mutualism, that's where when these two different species are living together, they both benefit. Uh, second case is commensalism. These two different species living together, one of them will benefit and the other is not affected. The third kind, my favorite, is parasitism. Those two different types of species are living together, one of them benefits and the other is harmed in the process. We also talked about predator-prey. Predator-prey is different from parasitism. Parasitism is a symbiosis where they, the two species live together. There's no living together with predator prey. It's I catch you and I eat you. That feeding happens in seconds or minutes or maybe hours. Whereas with parasitism, it happens over a lifetime. So predator prey, when we talk about it, we also need to introduce a couple more terms. Specifically first, competition. With predator-prey comes competition. S different organisms are going to be fighting over the same resource. And the way you can tell if an organism is fighting over the same resource, whether they're competing with each other or not, is to examine their niche. What is their role in the environment? If their roles 
overlap, like who they eat, what eats them, where they live, when they feed. If there's some overlap, they are competing with each other. If their niches overlap, they compete with each other. Finally, we talked about one way that organisms can coexist, and that's called resource partitioning. If the organisms have very similar niches, but they don't quite overlap, then that's called resource partitioning, where there's actually some small divide between the resources, between the species. And as long as that exists, they can happily coexist. They're not competing with each other. Again, that's called resource partitioning. That's it for this video. We're all done with interdependence. See you next time.